Hey everybody, it's Christian Buckley doing another MVP Buzz Chat, and I'm talking today with James. Hello. Hello there. So for folks that don't know you, James, who are you, where are you, and what do you do? So I am a Director of Development Operations at Coyote Software. I am based in United Kingdom in London. Um, my role is responsibility of platform engineering, development operations, SRE, and also uh, automating testing. Um, my day-to-day -day is pretty much anything yeah, operational, making developers' lives easier, uh, empowering developers. Um, as part of that, I'm a Microsoft MVP, Ashley Corp Ambassador, and a Microsoft Certified Trainer, as well as hold um, many certifications in Microsoft and other areas. So I'm a big advocate in the community. You're you're in that world of the certifications. I just saw um, uh, so somebody, one of your countrymen, uh, Sarah Fenna, had her page of her certifications around that. Like, you know, I, it's a man that that's a full time job keeping up with uh, each of those things. But uh, so, well, more power to you there. Well, it's it's interesting. So you're a an Azure MVP. Yes. It, with with Microsoft kind of shifting back to a more granular focus like they like so i i started as a sharepoint mvp i'm on my fifth or sixth rewrite of that or bucket that they put us in for that that mvp um and and, and suddenly i see somebody got a, a, a brand new mvp this month as a sharepoint mvp like there's a powerpoint mvp there's like they're again doing that naming the specific technology that they're really focused on so if that were the case if it were more granular what specifically would you be focused in like on the DevOps side of things, or is there a particular technology that you gravitate towards? Yeah, it would be more focused on DevOps. Yeah. When we go through um, highlighting our contributions over the year, it's very hard, um, hard for, um, I was, I would imagine marks of when I am listing items where I'm talking about Azure, but working on things like Terraform and um, in that, same bracket of that content so when i'm listening it, it's like oh it's a developer content as well as an azure content but it's that middle ground where it's devops and that's where if if it's going to get become that much more fine uh, grand, uh finer um identified um mvp status i would imagine that devops would be that area um of um, expertise that i fall into well, it's, it's amazing how much that space has evolved because uh, when I was, uh, so years ago, actually prior to joining the Microsoft ecosystem, and I, I worked in, you know, IT teams and a number of startups and some big companies and, you know, DevOps was not a phrase that was out there. We did, you know, SEM, um, you know, uh, so the, the source code management, um, you know, worked with engineers and giving them the tools. I was in the project portfolio management side of things, not quite in the DevOps space, but again, I was managing what engineers were doing as well as what the PMs and business analysts were doing as well as far as the tools. You know, what, what's been your, like your uh, primary topics that you've been talking about, speaking on, writing about? In fact, what, what are your primary contribution types? Do you are you more comfortable writing or videos? So over the last few years, it's it's all writing. I have a very detailed blog. Give yeah, I usually at least contribute once a month, two at least. Um, but this year, I have pushed myself to doing YouTube content. So over the last couple of weeks, I've been releasing at least two videos a week. So that's my target now to do that as well as continuing the blog writing as well. So um, yeah, it's one of those things you've had i'm trying to show the tech side of things how how for me i find dev like doing devops is quite easy but when i talk to people and they explain how, how i feel something so easy to do people go i didn't know that or that's quite difficult for me and i found out from going to other organizations and talking to them is actually the, the same uh just the same um statement i don't know if we're doing DevOps right, or if our DevOps is successful, and these are the, like what I'm trying to create content for is, 
oh i i've done this have a look at what i've done and i get a lot of feedback here from people going oh this saved me hours oh this has helped me in the right direction mm -hmm. and we we say like devops is not um all about tech and this is one of the things we say to execs here that's not oh yeah you can buy a devops product and go okay now you're doing devops it's not it's the culture side of things as well and again that's what i'm trying to advocate especially this year i'm doing a few talks on um effective leadership and also uh successful development operations trying to get across here that culture is a very primary thing that you need to ingrain but you also need to have the culture and the technology it's not just the tech it's not about the culture it's both together and you have to do that and get everybody on board so yeah, I have got a very similar topic, again, coming more from the project portfolio management side where I would talk about change management. Again, it's it's very much fits within this space. It's And, and it's not, you're right, it's not just about the tools because you could have 10 companies with a project management software package and they could use it 10 different ways. Uh, they can be, in fact, I was just talking with a, uh, a partner about creating features for a chargeback model for those that, have ever attempted to do that. I've worked with a couple of companies where we've attempted to do that, where you attempt to put pricing around like your internal IT services so that you can uh, allot budget that each business unit spends on IT, that, that kind of thing. Again, it could be very different between different organizations and culturally the organization's ability to do those, you know, take those, follow that methodology, follow the, you know, utilize those tools to their fullest extent. So yeah, that's a, it's the, the, the soft skill side of operations and engineering. Yeah. And this is where I find when I'm having conversations is trying to find the right um, person, which I, I say, it's not an individual thing. You usually need an advocate in a company yet and to make anything successful um, especially DevOps, but trying to find um, the middle ground between someone that has the soft skills and also the very technical skills and getting someone in the middle that can do both. And yep. this is where I try to advocate that you need to, sometimes you can find someone very technical and train them up here yeah, with the soft skills, yeah, and build them towards that uh, middle ground, yeah. And then the soft skills, yeah, it's quite um, good yeah, to then build them up to the technical. And that's what I try doing is trying to bring that middle ground to organizations so that we can not have one person in an organization that can advocate it all and deliver it all but we'll have multiple people that can bring all that together and all work as a team as well and that's what the devops culture is all about that yep. type of uh, approach so well that's what's it, again it's very similar uh, over on you know the 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 pmba side you know it's what business analysts do they're usually the people that understand the technology they may not be able to code they're not the engineers but they understand it and they communicate what they can translate business into technical and technical over to the business folks you also something else that you said uh, uh about you know people coming up and uh, and you know, things that might be easy for you i think one of the things that i remind you know uh mvps about talk about often is the fact you can't forget those kind of entry level topics because although you've mastered them and moved on and sometimes it's more exciting to talk about the new cool features and tools there's always people that are just at the beginning of their journeys and need that other fundamental content yeah and and that is literally what most conversations are you once you've done it, what I find is once I've done it, I move on to the next thing and more complicated. Yeah. I don't forget it, but then I take advantage that I know it now. I have that information, but organizations are quite still far behind in this type of journey. Um, some organizations, start, like startups, might not take the correct journey in regards to taking a development operational approach. And because of that, they then find themselves catching up yeah, with that curve. So even though you think a company's mature, they might be mature in regards to their growth, but not in their actual uh, operational um, culture. And having that conversation, like you say, you're going back to the basics, seems to be quite a common um, approach I find yeah, when I go to an organization. I, don't, I, I usually find it more interesting going into an organization where um, there's a lot of work to do. 
I, I, I would like to say, I mean, if I got bored, I think I'll move on. Um, to be honest, I like the interest of um, constantly doing, working, finding something challenging. And when I do find an organization but where there needs a lot of work, need doing, that's interest me. But usually you have to start with, I, I usually say it's the foundation. Um, my my father-in-law um, and my wife's uh, side of the family, it's uh, all construction. They do some type, mm. uh, it, it's either... Um, general trade uh um yeah plumbing all that so when i talk to them they always talk about construction so I, and i've started using the terminology that when we talk about building um if we look at a structure it's usually easier just to tear down the structure and rebuild it again so the easiest way to do it is to start with a new foundation and build up from there trying to work with a falling structure it's a lot of work. It, it requires a lot of support and everything, and it can take much longer. Sometimes, if you can start with a clean slate, it's better to start with a clean slate. And most of the organisations are more than happy and willing to start with a clean slate and work on that culture. Yeah, I, I, no, I've hey, I've seen that many, many times. And you have uh, you know new leadership coming in and saying, hey, we're going to completely change the way that we're doing this there's things that we're doing well we want to leverage those things but um especially with the technologies like we're going to fundamentally change this and do this different and it's i mean sometimes you you know that you've you have uh, or that new leader has the support of the executive team the founders the ceo whatever because they're allowing them to come in and make that change they're invested in hey you know part of hiring that person bringing in that expert is because they have, they've been successful in doing it that other way. So, yeah, it change for change sake is never great. No, hundred um, percent. And it, I think I think if an organization's honest here yeah, with you, if they if they're going out for recruitment and they need someone yeah to come in, I think they understand yeah they if they're looking for that uh, specific role, um, it's for either because they're doing it really well. Which if I look at it and I go, okay, well, that might bore me bored me a little bit. But if I um saying that there's a challenge we're having like we're we're starting out our journey or we've tried doing this journey, it's not worked out, and we're trying to revisit it, that's where it's like, okay, so is change needed? And they go, Yes, because it's what's currently working is not working for us, or we're starting from scratch, and then that's where I go, Oh yeah. I, I, that interests me a lot. That does. Yeah. Well it's and the other side of it too is that in operations management, again, I spent about half of my career in in those types of roles, running operations teams and IT operations, um, and where you're continually looking at and assessing, what are we doing? Is this healthy? Is this the right way? Can it be done better? So even though you might be high performing, I mean, that's why I'm a big fan of like the maturity model in general. And there's maturity models on just about every system and types of organization. But just to, you might be high performing, high functioning in some areas and below average in other areas. And so there's always, um, you know, you're, you're never done because people change, technology changes, the business requirements change, all those things which can impact. Now, whether that you're interested in going through the constant, you know, uh, uh, review and, and changing that up, there's something to be said about, uh, career progression, trying different roles, doing other things, moving yeah. around, not just staying someplace. But there's some people that just absolutely love that, love that space. Yeah, hundred percent. Yeah. Again, I've, I've had that experience before and I really enjoy it myself. <clears throat> and when, especially now, I think tech, techs um, over the last few years, we say, we always say, yeah, I think it's a repeat, repetitive um, comment here. We say yeah, that tech's growing so much and it's, it's, it's changing so rapidly. And we say that so often. And then over the last 12 months, we've even seen a massive even more, uh, oh. rapid change. Yeah. And ev everyone, uh, execs, yeah, uh, engineering managers and all that, all talking about, oh, how do we add AI or how do we uh, embrace AI and how does AI impact us? And you're like, oh, that's another change. And we know that over the next month, few months, yeah, over the next few years, yeah, that there's going to be something else, yeah, or the growth in these areas, yeah, where we're working on, um, especially with Microsoft products, for example, where they're moving a lot of their power platforms, yeah, over to like more of a fabric, the, the new fabric platform, and that's a change, even though it doesn't look 
massively changeable but from a uh organization operational side of things it's like well this changes is more in, in grind into azure and you're like how does this work how does that work and all that changes yeah <laughs> yeah always... it's it, it's a it's, it's interesting uh, so I, I i joined my first SaaS software company in 2001 and uh, what we went up against trying to sell customers and partners, bringing them in um, uh, of the benefits of the cloud. It was a really tough sell back then. Um, joined Microsoft in 2006 at the beginning of what is now Office 365. And again, selling people on the cloud. And I was talking with Jeff Teeper, uh, president of collaborative apps at Microsoft about you know the cloud journey. And he said he felt it wasn't until like 2015, 2016, you know, when he felt like people finally clicked, like they got the cloud, they understood the benefits and kind of the momentum was towards the cloud. I think the citizen developer stuff, the power platform stuff sped up a lot of that, but you're right. I, I think all of that, I mean, that, that, that was 15, 16 years of that, that change. And over the last 12 months, with generative AI, I mean, we're seeing just shockwaves. Like, I don't think we've ever seen change this fast. Because even with the advent of the internet, I mean, that was a slow crawl to get performance up to we all had high-speed internet. Uh, you know, so this is just, uh, it, you're, you're right. It, it it just sounds like this throwaway phrase, like it's like change happens so fast or so many. Yeah. No, it's, it is. It's, it's the rate of change is speeding up. Yeah, and I think if that these organizations like Microsoft, yeah, AWS and Google Cloud, yeah, they all compete, yeah. So they need to go uh first to market, fast as possible. And they know they've learned over the years and lessons learned, and we do this at our own organizations, that you learn from your previous um uh, experiences. And for something like an AI generative product, it was easier to go, we're gonna give it to people for free to try. And then once you do that, people get using it and there's a buzzword and it gets loads of press about it. So this is all there. And then when you start releasing corporate and enterprise versions and go, okay, now you can build on it yourself. Yeah. Integrate it with your own products and here's some sessions and here's some free learning material. And oh, we're going to do loads of certifications. Yeah. On that. So you, you can build up your engineers on it. Yeah. And we can throw some experts for you yeah, to help you get it all uh, up to speed in your organization. 12 months years like the, the plans have been there for years yeah they knew what they're doing yeah. we can say it's a mark it's a marketing thing in regards to how they uh strategized it yeah and hit the market and 100 percent yeah it is a marketing strategy and it worked really well getting everybody all trained up and all ready and talking about and everything but saying that it's also how i see text moving forward now this is where we will see a day one announcement and how within 12 months that is literally all we're talking about and how people are scaling up on the end, how we need to evolve ourselves as engineers, operational IT in, in individuals. We need to start learning so much quicker. So there's a massive impact on us yeah. and the content side of things, even though we can learn from uh, people like Microsoft learn is how oh, we need to learn from each other. We need to start sharing that information as well. Yeah, that. well, well, that's what I'm most interested. I think 2024 really is. We're going to start seeing the, the, business application of the technology we got the hype cycle we got all the marketing push we all bit hard on this idea of of, of ai we're playing with the various technologies i'm paying for a couple different tools um that are adding value like i get it um the pricing that now it's like the 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 world is available uh you know everybody can get the uh uh, uh the the microsoft technology now like copilot is available to or not just the 300 seat threshold, the enterprises, there's the, like, I've got my own uh, instance. I, I've got the, like the home version. My family have, you know, teams and and the, the product suite, the productivity suite, office suite. And so now you can buy 20 bucks a seat, get everybody in there or, or just myself, you know, on those, those tools that I'm using um, as well as, you know, organizations under 300 seats can get the enterprise at 30 bucks a month as well. I mean, it, it's great to see that that happen that quickly, but I'm most interested now in seeing the case studies, the examples, here's what we actually did. So it's fine to go out there. Like everybody suddenly is an expert in AI, but 
what are the actual real world examples? Like James, I want to know how it's changing your job the DevOps. I think some exciting stories that are going to come out of there, how you're actually leveraging that on a day to day. So that's yeah. the, I think that's what that's, we're going to see this year. Yeah. And that's what I, I expect to show as well. Yeah. There's a lot coming out from, um, other individuals i've heard stories i've heard of i've experienced myself i'm working with our own internal development team in using things like github copilot to actually speed up yeah their coding delivery uh times yeah, and helping them write test uh, test plans and um uh helping with documentation which is a big thing in development so those stories I know, yeah, from my experience, are going to come out yeah, this year and it's going to be amazing on those topics as well as integrating them into business applications. And I am I do hope, I imagine it will happen this year, but I do hope that we will see very soon yeah, from others yeah, that, oh, this is what we did and this is how we did it and this is how yeah. much of an impact it's made. At the moment, like you say, we're a bit hard on AI. Let's yeah, see I, the result I, from it. I think that's just the, the necessary, it's the next step in, in the adoption cycle. The next group of people need to see the data. They need to see the specific scenarios. They, it, they can't just be like, hey, th we could use it this way. No, show me. Show me how this actually was used in these scenarios. And what are the data points? How much did it improve? And I think that's, yeah, that's going to be 2024. That's, it's it's going to be interesting. All of the marketing heavy presentations from last year uh, are need to make the switch over to practical application and data yes 100 i agree with that <laughs> well it should be interesting but james really appreciate your time great connecting with you for folks that want to connect with you reach out where are you most active in social where can people find you uh you can find me on linkedin um uh under james cook um i'm also active on x slash twitter uh at official cook j so either of those two platforms, you can contact Because of the, all the unofficial ones that are out there um, with your, your face out there. Yeah, I'm on, I'm, on, I'm on so many socials, yeah, trying to get, to get away from certain platforms. Yeah, but um, yeah, it's still, yeah. still the dominant ones. So yeah, those two are where I am prominently. So if you contact me on any of those or follow me on any of those, you'll get all my latest updates. Great. And of course, we'll have all the links to James' profile out on the blog post, out on YouTube and out on the podcast. So uh, James, thanks so much for your time. No, thank you. Wow.